Give Dad the gift of Father's Day fun, starting with a great selection of gear from Academy Sports and Outdoors. Swing by your local Academy store today or shop online at academy.com. Also, enjoy free in-store pickup with all your online orders in just two hours. So don't wait. Shop Father's Day gifts at Academy. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Fisherman's Post Saltwater Podcast Series. This episode is titled Early Summer Sheepshead. I'm going to be talking with Captain Rick Patterson of Cape Crusader Fishing Charters. He operates out of Chasing Tails Outdoors in Atlantic Beach. And we're going to be talking about locations, bait, gear, and then ultimately techniques. My name is Gary Hurley of Fisherman's Post. Fisherman's Post has been serving the saltwater fishing community since 2003. We've been bringing you fishing reports, fishing information, fishing tournaments, fishing schools. And here in our latest and greatest effort, the Fisherman's Post saltwater podcast series where we reach out to our captain and guide friends from up and down the North Carolina coast and ask them to share with us their insight, their knowledge on how to catch more fish more often. And in this endeavor, I'm joined by my podcast partner, Billy Thorpe of Thorpe Creative. Welcome to another episode, Billy. Hey, what's going on, Gary? Good to see you, man. Always, always a good time to be in the podcast chair. It is a good time to be in the podcast chair. I feel like I've been overly focused on weekly fishing reports. I haven't been as focused on podcasts, but it's good to get back to perhaps the genesis of all this online audio video delivery. Yeah. And this would be a good time for me to ask you, Gary, what are you talking about? Weekly fishing reports? What is that? <laughs> for people who don't know, well, like they might not know. What is that? <laughs> Fisherman's Post is now offering weekly inshore fishing reports and we're offering it behind a paid wall so you got to be a member you got to sign up 100 bucks for the year 10 bucks for the month we talked to a good 11 captains and guides from up and down the entire north carolina coast talk to each of them for about four to six minutes and they give us the latest on what's happening and then they also tell us their best piece of advice for the weekend ahead you know the weekend or best play to put a fish in the boat and more information on fishermanspost.com there you go man i love it i love that gary you just went right with the impromptu like poke Come on, Gary, pitch, pitch. Well, we're we're you pretty familiar it. with it, so it's pretty easy to just spout off about it. I mean, it's... We put a lot of work into it every week, and it really yeah. is amazing, man. It's a lot of fun uh, with those guides and, and also to learn all that information and know what's going on on the water. And I get to know it a couple of days before everyone else does, so that's a little, it gives me a little edge. So if you guys see me out there slaying them, you know why, because I'm editing the show. <laughs> okay, whatever. <laughs> anyway, I want to talk about this show. Let's get, let's right. get the road back on here. I want to thank our sponsors. Uh, we're talking about Bland Landscaping first up. Uh, Bland Landscaping, as you can see, has been established for over 46 years. They've been in business, and, and this is kind of interesting, man. They've actually uh, have over 500 full-time employees across the state of North Carolina. So talking about local business, supporting another local business, we really appreciate their sponsorship. And, Gary, they are looking for people to come work with them um, in different areas. they got the Wilmington area, the Raleigh area. Uh, the, or the Raleigh-Durham Triangle area, the Greensboro Triad area, uh, and also the Charlotte Metropolitan area. And they're looking for field managers, crew members, or, or crew leaders, production supervisors, all across all the markets that they serve. So I don't know if you saw the hat switch or not, but they sent us some swag. I noticed. So, I yeah. noticed. Yeah, there you go. Um, yeah, man. What I would say about Bland is what I like is they get it, man. People have to court employees now. And they're on board. They're like, we yeah. got a whole laundry list of benefits. Like, we're not just trying to churn and burn what we can get out of you for the cheapest price. We get it. You got to invest employees, future employees, current employees. And so I think, you know, I'm comfortable certainly endorsing them and saying, everyone, take a look, man. You're thinking about working outdoors for a company that gets it. Take a look. Yeah, absolutely, man. And that's in there. Also, if you're on the other side of that and you want to hire them for some stuff right now, they're looking for commercial, industrial and like homeowner association uh, relationships. So if you if you fit the bill for that and you, you want to get them to quote some stuff for you, reach out to them for that as well. So really appreciate those guys and another local company. Marine Warehouse Center, Ooh. love those guys. You see that quick? You didn't even see it. it was so fast. Boss move, man. How Boss many more move. sponsor hats can I get over here? I hope a lot. I got a quick message from them. We'll be right back. 
At Marine Warehouse, we have everything. We have new boats, we have parts, we have accessories, new trailers. We have a complete service department with highly trained technicians. Anything you need to get out on the water, we have. At Marine Warehouse Center, as we've grown over the last few years, now have a large section of marine supplies from start to finish for all your boating needs. What I love about this region is to be able to get out on the water and also we love to be able to get you out on the water. The best part of working at Marine Warehouse is being able to get involved with the customers and share a love for the water. Well, there you go, Gary. That's, that's your crew, man, keeping you alive, keeping yeah, you on the water. They're, get, they're getting ready to get my boat. I'm going to bring it in for just a couple of touch-ups, man. My uh, live well went out, my live wells went out, and my recessed middle cleats have finally gotten a little too temperamental in the up and down, so we're going to replace those with some that work work better. And so, yeah, man, I'm going to bring in the boat on a Monday, and I'm going to pick it up by Friday. How about that, man? Those guys oh, are man. on it. That's quick. That's quick. Yeah. And, you know, I'm excited too, because they've been helping my neighbor. My neighbor bought a little John boat. They got him a motor on there. They're getting him hooked up. He's got all his paint. I mean, it's good. It's going to be good. It's going to I'm good. glad I'm, I'm going to fish off of it. So, you know, don't buy a boat, get your neighbor you to buy a boat. <laughs> yeah. That's what I did. Sage, Sage advice. <laughs> anyway, man, any, any jokes from those guys? Are they on to something new these days? Ah, you know, I'm out of routine, but I do have a Terrell joke. Oh. I do. Um, here it is. Terrell's joke, not mine. What do bother what do bother jeez? What do bottom <laughs> fishermen use to blow their noses when they have a cold? I don't know, but I need it right now. So what is that? Anchor chips. A okay, that's a good one. That's a good one. I'm gonna give it to Terrell. That's good. That's All right. good. Email that's him. No that's no Dave Chappelle, but it's good. Terrell okay. the Joke Teller at AOL.com. Email. <laughs> I'll do that, Gary, right after I tell you about this fish picture. Gosh, these segues are getting so good after after two years of doing the show. Here we go. We got Harry Graves. That's yeah, Harry Graves. Okay, from Chesapeake, Virginia, with a nine plus pound sheep's head caught while fishing from Jeanette's Pier. Um, yeah, looking looking good, looking good fish. Thanks for uh, sending that in, Harry. And be sure that you guys send it in to Fisherman's Post. Send in your pictures so we can put them on the uh, podcast and judge you behind the scenes if it's a really nice And apparently pounds. you can just say your fish weighed whatever you want it to weigh. <laughs> <laughs> He's joking, Harry. He's joking. Harry doesn't joking, watch the show. He's good. <laughs> like, Email me, Harry. Call me out. We'll start the Harry and Gary show. Harry catches fish. Gary call, calls BS if it's what he says it weighs or not. No, I, I had no comment on Harry. I just said if you mail us in a fish, email us in a fish photo, you can say it weighed whatever you want. <laughs> whatever Make you put, up. we'll put in the caption. <laughs> We're not going to call you a liar. We're just going to run it. I don't know. Oh, man. No, it's good. I love it, man. So, uh, All right. Well, look, I'm going to go talk with Captain Rick Patterson. And, but when I'm done with talking with him about early summer sheep said, I'm coming back to you for Billy's best takeaway, Billy's best takeaway. I'm going to be ready, man. I'll be ready. All right. Well, cool. Well, it's my pleasure to welcome to the podcast for the first time, Captain Rick Patterson, Cape Crusader fishing charters out of Chase and Tails in the Atlantic Beach area. Early summer sheep said, welcome to the show, Rick. Thank you so much for joining us. How we doing? Glad to be here. Yeah, man, we are doing good. And, you know, we are here on the verge of summer. And I think that sheep's head have become a more popular species, especially since we're not catching or keeping flounder. So I think this is going to be a popular podcast. I think a lot of people have curiosity. However, as is tradition on the show, before we talk about the main event, you've got two questions to get through. You tell me you're ready. I give you question number one. Go. Question number one. Why should we sit here and listen or watch you talk about a sheep's head? <laughs> well, I've been guiding in this area for 20 years now, targeting the redfish, speckled trout, and sheep's head. So I've, I've uh, targeted these fish for a long time, figuring out where they're at, how to catch them, and all that stuff. So I, I don't want to say I'm 100% expert on them, but I've got a good knowledge of how and where to catch sheep head at. Um, is it suspect at all that there isn't a sheep's head in any of those fish behind you up on the wall? Uh, no, I mean, I just, I mean, I got one in a picture right behind me, but I mean, those other yeah, fish okay. are, 
All right, or that's good. And, uh, big speckled trout, but I, I guess I would, I would amount a sheephead because they are pretty fish. It would make a good amount. I just never done it. <laughs> Always end up eating them, so you know they don't ever make it that far. <laughs> All right. Well, let's um let's go to question number two. And as is tradition, question number two is a non-fishing related question. This question is a play off of your cap your your guide name, Cape Crusader Fishing Charters. And I'm wondering, this is a trivia question. Can you name for me one popular superhero that doesn't have a cape? Spider-Man. I think that's, does Spider-Man I don't even know the answer to my question. I wrote down Iron Man, but I think you're right with Spider-Man. I'm in. Spider-Man, Incredible Hulk. Uh, I used to get picked on all the time when I first started my business about Cape Crusader because I used to all... People always ask me, where's Robin at? You know, Batman thing. <laughs> and I told him, I said, look, man, you got to get your superheroes right. I'm the Cape Crusader. He was the Cape Crusader. I said, get your superheroes right. I used to hear that all the time. It was kind of funny. <laughs> all right. Well, let's talk Sheep's Head. I like the list and I like the order. So let's first talk about locations. You know, I mean, people people want to know, where do we go fish for Sheep's Head? Okay. Uh when you get on into the summertime like this, once these fish start start getting in, you know, out of the ocean, and a lot of times they'll start ganging up around, you know, jetties and stuff. That's always a good place to look for them, you know, earlier. But once we get on into like June and stuff, and, and even in late May, these fish are primarily come in, and, and you're gonna find them a lot around bridge pilings, dock pilings, any kind of structure that's you know, rocks or whatever that's got you know growth on it stuff. That's where they're gonna be at right now. All right. Well, I, I would love to know a little bit more. So by late May, they've mostly moved inshore. Is that, you know, and again, every year is different. We could talk about water temperature, but in general, late May is when the majority of the fish have moved in. Yeah. By late, by late May, most of the time, the, the, the fish are in the ocean. They've already come inside by then. Uh, I know sometimes around 1st of May, uh, middle of May up here, I'll see them out around some of the jetties and stuff like the Cape Lookout Rock Jetty. They'll they'll stage up there before they actually come come inside. So by end of by late May, first of June, those fish have done transitioned inside now. So I'm looking for around the bridge pilings, uh, dock pilings. That's the kind of areas I find them at. And if you got any kind of you know uh, like jetties inside or whatever, they're gonna be around that. So by now, these fish have actually come inside the inlets now. And so are you, can you still pull them off on the jetties? It's just not in the same numbers. I mean, I guess you can catch a fish just about anywhere, but I'm, I'm just trying to understand behavior. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, uh, they're, they're going to be out on the jetties all year long. I mean, I can't look at rock jetties going to have fish out there, you know, all year because, I mean, some of the some of the divers go out there and, you know, spear them and stuff like that. But I think the majority of them, from my experience by now, have moved inside. And they've then started staging up on the pilings and stuff like that by now. So I'm going to ask a few more questions about structure inside. So, uh, you know, I think bridges are pretty much everyone's on board with that, understanding that sheep's head hanging around bridges, the bridge pilings and all those pilings. Does it matter if a bridge piling is more in like 15 feet of water versus 50 feet of water? Like, or... I don't know. Uh, I, I definitely, I definitely like a bridge or a dock that's got some deeper water on it. Like, like boat docks, for instance. If you can find a boat dock where the intercoastal waterway runs right near it, that's always a good place. And as far as bridges, I mean, uh, you know, I, I fish bridges up here that may have fifty feet of water under them, or may just have fifteen to twenty feet of water on them. It just kind of depends on the bridge you're at. But g generally, you know, uh, it seems like I find them better when you got, got water depth of at least. 12 to 15 feet deep, you know, like the, the Atlantic Beach High Rise Bridge, you got 50 foot of water under that. The Water Oak River Bridge in Swansboro, you know, it's around 15 feet. And I, you know, that's, that, that's a really good place. So it definitely want to have some water depth around it for sure. So, and I, I might, maybe I'm beating this a little bit. Now I'm going to ask you about docks. So if I were like looking at docks, that would be prime sheep's head docks. I know you've already said like old growth. So you like the older docks with growth on it as opposed to new docks with not less, well, not as much growth on it. But if I'm still understanding water depth, is it more in, like a dock should be have at least X amount of water at low tide and it should be close to even deeper water or as long as it has X amount of water at low tide, like that's a prime target? Uh you, you you want some water depth on it even at low tide that's what i'm saying if you, if you can find a dock near the intercoastal waterway or even a dock that's in the marina that's been dredged out or something where you've got 
you know, anywhere from six to 10 feet of water right even on low tide. That's always good docks to look at. A lot of these docks, you know, that they're in shallow water, like on low tide, you know, you've got like a foot or two foot of water on them. I wouldn't primarily look on those areas. I would definitely try to try to focus on docks that are near deeper water, whether it's intercoastal waterway or main channel coming off the waterway or something like that. I mean, they definitely want to have some deeper water for that, for, for them to uh, move off of, you know, when a tide falls out. And are you ever looking for these fish on like oyster rocks or it's pretty much you want the structure we've talked about? Oh yeah, oyster rock, oyster rocks are a good place to find them at too. I mean, uh, matter of fact, I was up the river the other day fishing and I actually saw a sheephead tailing on on an oyster rock. So the, the, they definitely get on oyster rocks. That's a good place to fish. But as far as uh, ease of accessibility, I guess if, that's, if I'm saying it right, boat docks and bridge pilings are easier for a lot of people to target them sometimes because it's easier to fish them. Okay. Man, uh, I'm going to I'm gonna transition you to gear, and then we'll go to bait. But let's do the gear conversation. And I would say start with rod and reel suggestions, and then we'll move to terminal tackle. Okay, typically the rods and reels I use are like the 25 to 3000 series, whether you use a Shimano, a pin, or whatever. Uh, and I use a seven foot medium light to light action rod with uh, usually 15, 20 pound test line with a uh, 20 pound test leader. Now, sometimes if you get on, on some pilots and, and you got some really big sheephead, you might need to step it up some. I mean, and go up to a 4000 size reel would even up to. I mean, sheep, sometimes you may need a 30 or 40 pound test line because these things can pull real good and they'll try to wrap you up around a pylons for sure. But uh, I typically try to stay on the lighter end of it. But, you know, that's just preference for me because uh, well, 2,500 reel and 15 to 20 pound test braid line, you can, you can put a lot of pressure on a big fish. All right. And then what are we tying on the end of that? Okay. Uh, generally, uh, I'll use either Carolina rig with a real short leader you know, for uh, filler crabs or whatever, but also too, there's there's some new uh, new uh, lures out now. What's well, not really lures, but ways to rig up your crab. And one of one of my favorite right now is out is this is this right here made by a company called First Flight Lures. Uh, got them at Chasing Tails Outdoors. And, Hold it uh, up a little bit higher, please. A little bit higher. Up. See. There, there you go. go. Perfect. You see that good. Yep. I'm going to actually show you the bait out of the package here in a minute. And the reason I like these so good is that these, these baits come with the, uh, with the weight on them. See, see holding there in my hand and then it got the hook hanging under it. So you just hook your crab onto the, onto the bottom of that, on the hook. And then when you drop it right down beside the piling, the hook with the crab is right there, right against that weight. This right here was a very highly effective bait and uh way to rig them. And also to the bottom sweepers, I'm sure people have seen those before. Uh, Back up a little bit in front of your face. The, 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 those, those are really good baits right there, too. I, I like them. They work good for like using uh, sand fleas and stuff like that. But I actually like these new the, these uh, first flight lures uh, rigs better. I, I, like them. I like them a lot. I, I use that in Carolina rigs. Hey, will you but hold up say, that? I will say if you use a Carolina rig, you need a short leader because you don't want your crab floating away from the pilot. All right. If you would please hold up that first flight lure, the one out of the package, and just show us the holes, because I want them to. I want the people to see that it is basically an egg weight with a hook on it. We just didn't see the holes where you put the line through. Yes, yeah, so it's an egg weight with, with a hook on it, and you just and you just tie right onto the top of it. So, see right where your main line goes, right there. Okay. And when you tie it on there, you just got the egg weight, and it's and it's sitting there, just like this right here against a pilot. It's a highly effective bait. I mean, you drop it right down and work, it works really good. I use these a lot. I, I've really started using those a lot here the last few years. The only thing, it's got a little bit, it's got a little bit uh, a bigger hook on it for a fiddler crab. They work real good with mud crabs or something like that with just a little bit bigger bait. But these right here are really good because when you drop it down beside a pylon, I mean, the fish comes up, it's right in its face. All right. I got a couple of follow-up questions. Okay. And you're using a bottom sweeper jig. What kind of leader are you using? I use a, I use a twenty usually a twenty to twenty five pound test mono or uh, fluorocarbon to go onto my onto my uh, main line with a uh, unit to unit knot. That's that's all I tie. I would go with about a two and a half to three foot piece. And then on the Carolina rig, you're saying that Carolina rig should be no more than 
six inches, no more than four inches? Yeah, the reason for it being, okay, uh, like when, when, you're, when you're fishing a pylon, you want to put that bait on the down current side of the pylon. See, what's happening, sheephead are, are, are swimming up and down on those pylons, feeding on the barnacles and stuff like that. And the reason you want to go to short leader or this type of rig I'm showing right here is because that way when the sheephead, he's, he's going up and down on that pylon, if you've got too long of a leader in your crab or whatever you're using, crab, sea urchin, or whatever floats away from that pylon, well, he's not going to see it because it's going to be out behind him. So you want to go with a short leader or this rig I was showing you so that way when he comes up in a pylon and he's picking off those barnacles, that crab or whatever you're using is right in his face. That's why you want to use those short leaders or this rig right here I'm, I'm showing. Cool. I follow everything. So now let's transition to bait. I mean, you've already touched on some of the bait, but but walk me through your favorites, I guess. My favorite bait, you know, when I'm out on charters is definitely a filler crab because you're going to get more action out of that. Also, too, the mud crabs, you know, of course, the filler crabs are a lot easier to, are, are a lot easier to catch. You know, you go out on low tide and, and, and catch them yourself. The mud crabs, you actually got to get out and turn over oyster rocks and all that to find those, but they are really good bait. Uh, sea urchins are good, uh, but I, I normally stick with the, with the filler crabs because you're going to catch, you're going to get a little bit more action. If you're using a, if you're using a uh, sea urchin, you're mainly going to be targeting your bigger sheephead. And a lot of times on charters, it's, a little bit harder for somebody to catch a big one like that. So that's why I typically like to use filler crabs. I follow. Hey, so on the filler crab, um, if someone was saying, all right, catch them at low tide, you got any other suggestions for how my average angler can not get frustrated and actually have success with finding filler crabs? Like how else would you advise them besides low tide? Like what else to look for? Well, I mean, other than buying them, I mean, you have to, you know, you can go out and if the tide's not all the way low where the crabs have actually crawled out away from the holes, you got to go out there and try to dig them out. And that can definitely be a pain. I mean, sometimes I have to do that. But the best thing to do if you can find a day when a tide gets really, really low is they'll actually come out away from the grass and, and get down next to the water where you can go scoop them up. Or if you got two guys, you can get your little thing, herd them up and catch them like that. But, you know, if you got to go out and dig them up, dig them out sometimes, that can be a pain, but, you know, you can get them that way. And I know you have a relationship with Chasing Tails Outdoors. Are they selling everything we've mentioned here, fillers, mud crabs, and sea urchins? He, he, uh, Chasing Tails definitely has the filler crabs and sea urchins. The mud crabs, he don't, he don't carry those. I mean, because, you know, the, the, they're probably the hardest bait to get because you've actually got to go get out and, and, and turn over orchard, orchard, uh rocks and all that to get those but he's definitely got the fiddler crabs and sea urchins because they're the easiest to get um i got a question for you what about sand fleas man you ever mess around with sand fleas for sheep's head or not so much not so much but i know they are a highly effective bait and they work real good on those bottom sweepers i mean i know they work i, I have used them before in the past but you know going on a beach and having time to go out there and dig them out of the sand and stuff i just you know i I just don't do that. I just—it's a lot easier for me to go get the crabs. Gotcha. So that's why I don't use them that much. All right, and I'm—I'm I'm being detail heavy, but now I'm going to ask you any advice for how to hook a filler crab, like in where, out where. Okay, I take the filler crab and get him in your hand. I just go in the bottom of the shell and right out through the top. I mean, you know, he's—he's he's not going to live long, but I mean, that, that's the easiest way to hook him is—is—is is, is that just, just just right through the bottom and right out the top of the shell. All right, same question for mud crab. All right, the mud crab is going to be a little bit bigger. Usually, what I try to do with him is you gotta you gotta take the hook and work him through. Uh, depending on how big your mud crab is, I'll try to get him in the in the edge of his shell. And sometimes you gotta work that hook pretty good to get it through there because they're a little bit bigger and their, and their shell's a lot harder. So uh, I, I try to I try to hook those right in the side of the shell. Okay. I wish I had more to show you, but. <laughs> and then, as far as sea urchins go. Um, if my memory tells me from the winter fishing schools, you had a technique for cleaning up the sea urchins to make them much more manageable. Yeah, I mean, uh, the, the easiest way to deal with a sea urchin is, and I've seen people use scissors and all that, and that works fine, but the best way to do them, and the easiest way is to go to a hardware store or Lowe's or wherever and get you a pair of those big, thick uh, uh, yard gloves, and you can put that sea urchin in your hand, and you can just roll it around like this right here in your hand, and it busts every... It'll break off every one of the uh, spines on them, and when you got it, it's just, a, it's just a ball. That's the easiest way to get them because if you, you know, if you try to start cutting them off and stuff, I mean, it can get stuck with them. 
But the, but the yard gloves and rolling around your hand is absolutely the easiest way to do it. And then once I have a clean ball, how am I hooking that? Uh, if you look on the bottom of it, he's, I guess it's his mouth or whatever, and I just take the hook and just run it right up inside of that. And uh, usually it'll stay on your hook pretty good uh, because when, when a sheephead comes up, he's just going to come up and crunch it, and, you know, and the hook's going to be there. So that, that's the easiest way to hook those. Okay, so man. That's how I do it. I mean, somebody else might tell you something different. Um, as far I think that concludes bait, unless I haven't set you up with a question about something. So I'm guessing it's time to go to technique. And I would basically say, Hey, Rick, man, if let's talk about bridges, since people can easily visualize bridges. So you're walk me through your preparation, your setup, your strategy, you're pulling up to a bridge. What do you do? Okay. Like if I'm coming up to a bridge pile and wherever it's said in the tides, you know, going one way or the other. I'll come in from down current and I'll ease up to the pile and real slow, either with a trolling motor or your, or your big motor. And I'll pull up and uh, go right in and I'll tie the boat off on each end of the boat. So that way you can fish multiple pilings. Uh, probably one of the good examples that would be the Water River Bridge. I don't know if people's you know, familiar with that, but it got multiple pilings on there. So if you tie off the one on, a, on, you know, going into the current, then once you do that, you fish on the down current side of the pilot. That's what I was talking about a while ago when you drop that bait on that down current side. You want that bait as, as close to the pylon as you can get. You seize it down, and I'll start fishing from maybe four to six feet down all the way down to the bottom until I figure out which depth they're at. Does that so make is sense? it – yeah, no, that makes sense. Because, because a bridge has pylons that go along the way, but like you say, many bridges are three, four, five pylons wide. And yeah. so you're tying up underneath of there so that you have access to two, if not three pylons, if you're tying the front and the back right. and then targeting the down current side of the yeah. pylons. And then I guess my follow-up would be is, so is that typically what you do? You start hot, you know, depending on the depth of the bridge, the water under the bridge, you start higher and then work yourself deeper. Is that the, the normal flow? Yeah, that's typically what I do. I, I will say this one thing about sheephead. Uh, if you're going to fish a bridge, to me, it's the, it's when, when, the, when the bridge is the best, it's right at the top end of the high tide. Because what I've seen over the years, and I've got video of this, is those sheephead, they like to get up and feed on that new growth. And that's why I'm saying I always fish, you know, sh you know starting with four feet down. Is if you can get there right as the tide comes all the way high, and then when it first starts flowing out, you know, when that tide's high up on that new growth, to me, that's one of the pilings the best. I'm not saying you're not going to go there and fish them on low tide. You know, if you do, a lot of times they'll be down towards the bottom. You can't see them. But sometimes I come up to the bridge, and, and you actually look at looking at the fish when, when you're fishing for them, especially there on that, on that top end of the high tide. So, yeah, I, I mean, I'm understanding this. It's like a grass floods, and the red drum takes advantage of that brief time that the grass is flooded. So right. on the high tide on the bridge, the sheep said, take advantage of that quick time that they only have access to that part of the bridge. I mean, is that, yeah. am I saying what you're saying? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I mean, one thing I've seen is on that, on that high tide, those, those, the sheep, they like to get up and feed on that new growth. I mean, I've got some awesome video. I've took at them before. That's what I'm saying. I, I've, I've fished for them. I've watched them a lot and they definitely like to get up on that new growth and feed on that, on a higher tide. So that's what I'm saying. When I pull up to these pilings like that, I'll start fishing from about four feet down. And then sometimes you may have to go all the way down. Cause I mean, you know, sometimes they may be down on the bottom, closer to the bottom, but a lot of times on a, on a high tide, they'll be, they'll be higher up on the pilings. So you want to start fishing shallow before you, you know, before you work your way down. All bottom. right. So on your boat, I'm guessing you often have anglers of different skill level and these sheep's head are stealth. I mean, they're, bait stealers, they're convict fish, they're striped convicts, whatever. So how do you advise your guests, your clients, so that they set the hook and don't feed the fish? Or that's, that's one of the hardest things about learning to catch sheephead is, is, is when you're using, everybody always wants to jerk too fast because a lot of times that sheephead will come up there to that crab and, and you'll feel him you know, just barely peck on it. And a lot of times people want to set the hook right in. That's what you don't want to do. You'll miss him just about every time you pull it back up and you got half your crab gone. The best thing to do, what I found over the years is, is you drop your bait down there and when a sheephead gets set, you'll feel him start pulling away. So when I feel that bite, I don't ever jerk until I, 
all of a sudden you'll feel your line get heavy or you'll actually feel him swimming off. That's when you want to hit him because he's got that crab and hook in his mouth. If you jerk too soon, like I said, when you first feel that initial bite, you're going to pull it away from him and you'll, you'll pull it out of his mouth and come back and you've got a crab shell. Wait on him. to you, You'll feel the weight of the fish before you need to set the hook. It takes a few times to do it, but once you, once you figure it out, it's, it's pretty easy to do it then. So they're, when they're pecking at it, and I, you know, are they crushing it? Is that the game that they're playing as they're trying to smush it? Or are they just sort of not committing to it and checking it out? Any thoughts on what they're doing before they put weight on the hook? Yeah, I think sometimes, especially if you got an area where you got some smaller sheephead, a lot of times they'll come up and they'll peck on the crab and stuff. And sometimes that could be pinfish, you know, doing it as well. That's why I'm saying you need to wait. But uh, usually if you got a big sheephead, you, you're going to, I mean, all of a sudden you're just going to feel your line get heavy. He's going to start moving off. I mean, it's, it's very, it's a very distinct bite. But that's, that's the one tip I can give to everybody is don't jerk too soon. When you, when you first feel that, that fish bite, like he maybe come up and just mouth the crab a little bit, just peck on it maybe bite his legs or something off, whatever they're doing. Don't jerk in. Wait till you feel that fish swimming off. Wait till you feel his weight and then set the hook. Because you'll get him then because he's got the hook in his mouth when he's swimming off. And Be ready. All right. And so I'm ready. That leads me to my next question, which is, all right, I am on your boat and I have followed your advice and I didn't jerk too soon. I felt the weight. And then all of a sudden I give it a little bit and he is home. Now, what's the thing you want to do? What's the thing you want to make sure you avoid doing? You want to try to keep him from wrapping you around the pylons. You just got to – It's sometimes you have to use a tighter drag, and it's, it's, it's almost like group fishing, I guess. I mean, you know, you've got to try to get them away from the pylons, you know, because they, they'll definitely want to wrap you up, especially if you've got a big one. And you've got, you've got to put it on him and really, and really pull him up away from the pylons, I mean, without breaking your line. But, I mean, it's just – there's the, there's no really no good technique I can tell you once you hook him up except just try to keep him from getting you around the pylons is all we can do because <laughs> these things can't pull good. Um, well, I, this has been good and I think we're close to the end of it, but I do have a couple more questions. Man, are are you in the camp of I'm going to knock some barnacles off the side of these pylons to kind of chum the water? Or are you? No, nah, I don't need to do that. I'm just presenting crabs properly. You know, I, I've done some of that, you know, scraping the pylons and stuff, and, and it works. And then I've tried it other times, and it's like one of those things, I mean, everybody's going to have a different opinion. Somebody's going to say, oh, yeah, that works real good. And somebody like me, you know, sometimes I, I do that and other times I don't. I mean, I've seen it work, but generally if the, if the fish are there, you don't need I, – I don't, I don't typically do that a whole lot. I mean, I'm not saying not to. I mean, you know, if you're on a if you're on a pile and you want to do that, you know, absolutely that can work. But the biggest thing you got to have the fish there. All right, so that's a good setup for my next question, which is, how long do you fish a pile in before you say they're not here? Let's try something new. Let's try a different area. Maybe 10, 15 minutes. I mean, you know, t typically when the sheep head are on the bridge pilings. If they're there, you're going to know real fast. I mean, a lot of times, as soon as you drop that crab down, if he's there, you're going to get bit. You know, uh, so when I'm fishing a bridge pile, and I may give one 10 or 15 minutes. If I don't get bit by then, I'm going to move. Now, I mean, you could sit there, you know, and, and some fish may come in, but a lot of times I don't have time to do that. I've got to pull up, and if we, if we fish it 10, 15 minutes tops, and we don't get a bite, I'm moving to the next pile. All right, and now I'm talking – so this is we're talking early summer sheep said but it sounds like these fish are hanging out in the same region all summer long is that true and then from your vantage point when do they start moving back to the inlets back outside well i will say this i mean in, in up here in this area and it's probably probably most places it seemed like to me the the bridge piles were best the month of june through early July. And then it's like, once the heat of the summer gets here, I mean, I don't know where these fish move off to. I think, I, I think sometimes they go out into the bays and get in the, get around the grass and stuff. Cause I see them a lot when I'm out red fishing. I, they, they just kind of move away from the pylons. You know, I don't, I don't catch them as good in those areas on in the summertime. You know, I'm talking like July and August. I'm, I'm not saying you won't, but I typically do better on them when they first coming out of the ocean, you know, like in late May and through the month of June. And then, uh, of course, in the fall of the year, they start migrating back out to the ocean, and that's when your jetties 
come back into play again, you know, and some of your boat docks on your waterway, like if you got a waterway that's, you know, we're leading out to the ocean, they'll get on those pylons there. I mean, you know, state, you know, they're doing this, getting ready to head back out into the ocean again. All right. And I think we're at my last question on sheep's head, and that would be, you got a favorite sheep's head recipe? Of course, cutting them up in a nuggets and frying them is always good. You know, but they're, they're really good. Uh, bait, uh, broiled. I haven't tried one on the grill yet. I'm sure it'll be good. You, if you've done it just like a redfish, you know, laid him down, skin side down and grilled him, it'll probably be good because they've got a real white flaky meat and they're a mild fish and they're really good. There's all kinds of recipes you can do with them, but I, I, you know, I like to fry them in the nuggets and make tacos out of them. Uh, I have baked them before, but I want to try, I haven't grilled any of them yet. I got to try that. I'm sure they'd be good, you know, but, you know, probably like a redfish. I'm sure they'd be good too, man. All right. Hey, uh, Captain Rick Patterson and Cape Crusader Charters, you're, you're more than sheep said. Give me the quick highlight reel about what Cape Crusader likes to target spring, summer, fall. Of course, our number one go-to fish is always redfish, you know, speckled trout, uh, black drum, sheephead. I mean, I, I, I exclusively do inshore fish, you know, fishing now. Uh, I don't go out, I don't go outside the inlet anymore. I just, you know, all typically, you know, inshore stuff. So our, our, our main fish are redfish, trout, black drum, sheephead, and flounder when the season's in. All right. Hey, and uh, I know you have a strong relationship with Chasing Tails Outdoors. You know, give uh, I'm going to give you a, a couple of sentences. Tell people what's so good about Chasing Tails Outdoors. Chasing Tails Outdoors, they got all the tackle you absolutely need. I mean, for whether you're where you're going, artificial or live bait, we got all the live bait there. Finger mullet, uh, crabs. Got some got some shrimp there now. Just brought them in the other day. Live shrimp. And they've got all the all the artificial tackle you knew, and we got a really good staff, and we got you know some some of the best guides on the coast run out of there. So when you come to Chasing Tails, you're going to absolutely get what you need. <laughs> That's perfect, man. I'm glad I set you up for that. Hey, Captain Rick, thoroughly enjoyed our sheep's head conversation, man. You know, have a good season, and I, I look forward to whatever reason brings us together again soon. Sounds good, man. Looking forward to it. Thank you, Rick. All right, Billy, Gary, Gary. That was Matt, a Matt over chasing tails. Head. Matt over chasing tails. I'll be sending you an invoice for that promo. It's so good. I'm just. Does, I mean, Rick speaks truth, man. He's got a <laughs> great good. operation going out there. Yeah, man. Those guys always do a good job. Man, what an episode, Gary. I learned so much. I got a whole page, no crap of, of sheep's head information from rig to lures to all well, kinds of stuff. I'm not interested in a page. I'm interested in Billy's singular best takeaway well gary i'm gonna take two loves of your life that is the english language a homonym if i said that right <laughs> and uh and my fishing takeaway uh, which i know you love those as well so uh drop your bait wait drop your bait and wait for the weight there you go i don't know if that if i did that properly but you did it was great you did yes. it great perfect <laughs> you That's nailed it <laughs> good there we go this is what i get for hanging out with an english professor i learned a thing or two along the way i don't i don't usually bring people up i feel like i usually bring people down so this is this is a moment for me as well <laughs> oh man it was a great episode so yeah so so soak your bait and just wait for the weight of the fish to pull away before you set the hook so i, I know that's one of the things when i'm talking to people about Sheep's head fishing, they're always like, dude, how in the world do I hook them? And there you go. There's the answer. You burn through some crabs. I mean, even if you follow Rick's advice, man, you're going to burn through some crabs. Yeah, that sounds good, man. Well, Gary, it was a great episode, man. Thanks uh, thanks for bringing on the guest and Rick. And, and you guys connect with Rick and let him take you out there and show you how it's done. So, right? And, That's and go the deal. Chasing tails. Go, go see Matt and tell, and tell Matt the Fisherman's Post guys sent him. We always love those guys. <laughs> or Rick. We'll give Rick. This is Rick's we'll give, show. We'll, we'll give, give Rick. Rick. We'll give some Rick credit. Rick and, and Fisherman's. There we go. Anyway. All right, Gary. Anything else before we get out of here? One more. Why don't you give one more thank of the sponsors? Yeah, absolutely. Marine Warehouse Center, Bland Landscaping Company, and Academy Sports for this episode. Thank you all so much for sponsoring the show. Be sure to support these uh, sponsors when you can. Uh, they, they support us. They support this fishing podcast and make it available for free for everyone. So uh, we really appreciate them doing that and being a part of the show. And then if you want some more 
information, content, how to go check out the uh, go check out our uh, weekly fishing reports. A lot of good weekly inshore in fishing reports. Fishermanspost.com. Awesome. All right, Gary. We'll see you in the next one, man. Thanks. Fisherman.